Good morning, everyone. Uh, we know that there's a few of you still getting lunch, but we'll, uh, we'll get started so that we can get through most of the questions and then move to audience questions. Um, welcome today to the great net neutrality debate being put on by both Berkman Klein and, uh, and Jolt. This talk is going to be mostly about the January 4th order, and our two experts, uh, Matt Wood and Professor Christopher Yu, are going to be debating um, the implications of it, the policy, the legal background of it. Uh, Professor Christopher Yu is the John H. Chestnut Professor of Law, Communication and Computer, and Information Science at the University of Pennsylvania, and the director of its Center for Technology, uh, Innovation, and Competition. Professor Yu is a graduate from Northwestern and clerked for Anthony Kennedy before joining, uh, before joining uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Uh, Matt Wood is the director of the policy director at Free Press, which is one of the country's leading net neutrality advocacy groups, which has been very involved in the state attorney's general lawsuit recently. He'll be taking the other side of, uh, of the debate and a HLS grad and former Jolt subsider, I am told, in one his year. bio. Yeah. Um, you got to play to the crowd. So, we'll, so the rules for today are going to be simple. We're going to give each uh, presenter two minutes to speak to their point and then give two minutes to the other for rebuttal. We're going to start with just an intro from each of them, telling them us a little bit about themselves, and then we'll get right into the debate. So if, uh, if Matt, you'd like to lead off, and then we'll, we'll move to you, Professor. Uh, sure. So briefly, I assume a lot of people have heard about net neutrality. It's been in the news. It's been much discussed. And here you are. Uh, for those who haven't been as much into the weeds and in the docket, the FCC's order was voted on last December. Uh, as Alex was saying, it was released just a few weeks ago here in January. It took away the net neutrality rules that the previous Federal Communications Commission put in place in 2015. And these really aren't new concepts or new rules. I would start by saying net neutrality is basically a fundamental non-discrimination law for internet access or for internet users. That's really the debate. It's not just the rules themselves, which did things like, and have now been repealed, but did things like prevent internet service providers from blocking or throttling or charging more to reach certain websites or use certain apps. Uh, those rules are important very much so, and we care about those. But we also care at my organization about the legal foundation for the rules. And they were based, uh, the, the repeal is not effective yet, but the rules that have been repealed were based on what's called Title II of the Communications Act, and specifically on provisions in that act that prohibit uh, internet service providers, or at least prohibit telecom providers, from unreasonably discriminating against their customers. So that's really the foundation is, do we need that law in the first place? We think yes. And do we need rules that then make that more specific and build on top of that non-discrimination mandate? Well, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, one, because it's hosted by the Journal of Law and Technology. Actually, I've published twice there. I wrote an article called Beyond Network Neutrality, which was dated 2005, showing my total <laughs> inability to predict uh, the future. Um, and for many years was the most cited article by the journal. I don't know if it's still true, but it's uh, been a hot topic. But it was on, uh, most downloaded on the website, and that's how it shows. I also bear, feel I bear a certain responsibility for being here, which is I actually um, wrote what many people regard as the second article on network neutrality. And it's sort of well, funny. Tim Wu is credited with uh, creating the, the word because he's the first one to use it in print in 2003. In a journal, they actually, the next year, the conference the next year, asked me to write a response, and he wrote a rebuttal to that. And so actually, in some ways, I was the first to engage him on this, although the issues go back much farther. So I bear some responsibility for starting this fight. I do not take responsibility for how long it's gone on. I've been predicting its death since at least 2007, and it just refuses to go away. Um, I think it's interesting. Matt, the most recent order is the most, the 2000. Well, 16 order, depending on 17 order or 2018, depending on whether it's voted when it's released, it depends on how you think about it, is actually the last in a, a long series. And um, it's actually, I think, a little bit more complicated than Matt suggests, which is network neutrality has been a bit of a moving target. In 2005, in the policy statement, it really was about non blocking. And in fact, Michael Copps, in a series of speeches, really said, we need to make this about non discrimination, because at that point it wasn't. In 2010, it did become about non discrimination. And then in the end, it became about, uh, we added in 2015 interconnection. And so we have different aspects of this order that have moved along. The two things I'll say, just to preface it, is from a historical standpoint, since the beginning of IPv4, there has been something called the type of service flag, which was designed for prioritization. It was retained in IPv6, and they added a, a field called the flow label. This has been part of the design since the beginning has not always been used much, but it's an interesting exploration. Do we have five or two? It's five in the beginning, isn't it? Or do you want two? We can change the two. Okay, it's fine. The other thing, so first, as, as a historical matter, it is going longer. I'll leave the last second. The second thing I will say is, 
No technical architecture does everything well. They all involve trade-offs. And we had an architecture that was designed for a context in the 70s and really blew up in the 1990s around web and email, which was about a PC connected to a phone line doing file transfer programs before we had smartphones and wireless. The world we're in, and I've had to talk about this in the conversation, is very different now. And the interesting question to me is, as what we demand from the network becomes more intense and more heterogeneous, when and under what circumstances should we expect that architecture to change? And that, to me, is sort of how I think about this problem. All right, thank you both very much. We're going to get into the questions. Uh, we're going to start with you, Professor Yu. Sure. Um, we would like, so most of us in this room have heard of net neutrality. We've heard about it talked about. But it's not clear to a lot of us as students what exactly, um, what exactly the terms of the old open internet order were, what the January 4th order did. Can you explain to us really quickly what that order did in your own words? And then we'll go to, uh, to Mr. Wood. So the first, uh, it is, if you think about the evolution of this, it pulled back from the 2015 order. The 2010 order we can talk about, but I'll set that to, for, to one side. It's the third of three orders. The 2015 order created three rules and a general conduct rule. Uh, Non-blocking, um, transparency, if you will, not, I'm going to paraphrase, non-blocking and non-discrimination. Now, they're not going to use the word non-discrimination because of the reason the 2010 order was set, struck down is because it used that word, but it effectively no it's disadvantage or these different aspects. Um, the 2017 order kept transparency but modified it, got rid of the blocking rule, got rid of the prioritization, no paid prioritization rule, and got rid of the general conduct standard. And so we still have, and changed the legal basis on which they acted from what the SEC did in 2005 was they did not fold, we we're the only country in the world that did not fold the internet in the traditional regulatory regime that governs the telephone network as developed. Uh, in 2015, we changed that. 2017, 18, changed that back. So the legal basis changed and the scope of the orders changed, so it was just transparency now. Yeah, I mean, and maybe I'll take a step back and, and go back to what we were talking about at the beginning, too, and say, obviously, this is a long debate. It actually probably started in the 60s, if we don't want to keep going back to the beginning of time and talk about when computers first started being used to send information over phone networks. So if we throw a lot of dates at you, 2005, 2010, 2014, 2015, 2000, I mean, it, it gets confusing. But basically, as I started by saying, I think it's the same debate throughout, even though, as Professor you mentioned, it's changed over time as to exactly what's encompassed. So as he said, the 2017 order repealed the 2015 order, and that order had these conduct rules that prevented things like blocking, throttling, discrimination by internet service providers. It did retain some kind of transparency rules. So we have in the hopper now transparency rules that say if the ISP tells you it's going to block, it's OK. You know, they still have to tell you. They have to tell you what they're going to do in advance, much like we see with privacy policies today and the Federal Trade Com uh, Commission's enforcement of those. So there's some debate about whether or not that transparency alone framework will be sufficient, having stripped away all of the conduct rules. And I guess I would say that we don't think it will be, to put it mildly, because for one thing, we don't think that's enough to protect internet users. But for two, the major thing this last order did was once again shift the legal ground that we're standing on. And so even for things like transparency requirements, you know, they've changed the portions of the statute they're pointing to and in some cases not pointing to, if we really want to get into the weeds and talk about administrative law and uh, some of the failures in the order on that ground. So it stripped away the, the rules, but it also changed the legal framework. And I'll sound like a broken record here, but to us, that's very important. You know, the legal framework and preserving internet users' rights to non-discriminatory telecommunications is exactly what we think the FCC should be doing. Uh, to go back to what Professor Yu said at the beginning, yes, there are ways in the network to prioritize certain kinds of content. Really, our question, and I think everybody's question, should be who gets to make those decisions? Is it the content provider and the internet user on the edges of the network, or does the internet service provider in the middle have a role to play in deciding what you can do and what you can say online? Thank you. Uh, to follow up on a question, or sorry, on a, a point you brought up, Professor Yu, could you explain for everyone in the room uh, those four concepts that you brought up, blocking, sure. transparency, discrimination? Can you flesh out a little more exactly what those concepts mean? So transparency uh, is a bit, it has changed over time, but it's basically explaining to people what service you're providing them. And in general, we all understand networks get congested, and 
right now, um, Netflix is about a third of the prime of the internet in terms of peak times, which is what matters, is what causes a congestion. YouTube is about another, between the two of them, is a little over half. And so it's, large, it's largely video. And so what we see is these enormous things of video have really changed the way we do things. Um, it is very common for networks in an application neutral way to, uh, when you use too much bandwidth, to cut you back. So there are our bandwidth hogs, you use a lot of it. And but the reality is, if you do that in an application, if you hit your bandwidth cap, they would say, there are appropriate congestion management techniques as long as you disclose what they are and everyone knows what they're getting and they buy the tier that they should get. Uh, there's a, probably a way to do that that complies with transparency. Non-blocking is uh, you can't stop someone from reaching a particular website. So um, suppose that you didn't want them to reach, I mean, one of the standard uh, accusations is there was a labor dispute in a, Can a Canadian ISP. The ISP blocked people from reaching the union website because they didn't like the content. And, uh, the non-blocking rule says, said you can't do that, or you can't slow it down so much that it's effectively blocking. You're not literally blocking it, but yeah, you really are. Uh, the no paid prioritization rule was uh, you can't pay for play. You can't pay for a higher quality service and get better service. Uh, and the last the reasonable conduct was the backup was no is sort of a reasonable general reasonableness requirement about what you should do. All of these were subject to exceptions. One for reasonable network management, one for security, illegal activity, and the like. And there was another category called specialized services, the classic examples point in the orders. Uh, Amazon used to use dedicated bandwidth to send updates of your, to your, e -kind, your Kindle reader for books, and they paid Sprint for it. And many people use, for example, dedicated bandwidth for voice calls, because voice calls are very sensitive to delay. So what they do is they have a special channel to do that. That's what they called specialized services. And in the order as defined, those were things that were application specific. In other words, you're not doing a general service to the internet, for priority service. You're selling a very specific one for something that needs it, like voice or the Kindle. And as we said, the transparency rule still survives in a modified form. All the other things I discussed have now been repealed. Mr. Wood, would you like to respond? Yeah, Alex was asking if we'd agree on anything. So I can say we do probably agree largely on those contours. I think a few things to add. Uh, I'll, get, I'll get logical for a second. All networks can be congested. Some networks are congested. Not all networks are congested at all times. And so that's really where at least one of the touchstones of this debate was when Comcast was in 2007 throttling back or effectively blocking all BitTorrent streams for some of its users because BitTorrent might be congesting the network. You know, this is a copyright debate as well. People were concerned about uh, pirate video or illegal video, uncopyrighted video. So Comcast was basically dropping and blocking all BitTorrent streams. And to me, that's wildly over-inclusive by them. And eventually, Comcast, after a hearing right here, uh, hosted by the Berkman Center then in 2008, changed its policies and stopped blocking all BitTorrent streams, instead decided to throttle people back when and where congestion occurred in the network. So that's important. And you know, bandwidth hogs are sometimes also referred to as paying customers. So people demand video, and sometimes it gets congested. But oftentimes it's not, and that's why we think that there is any number of reasons to have reasonableness tests for what the ISPs are doing. Uh, and do you think the final solution Comcast came through is, is appropriate? Yeah, it was. I mean, it was, it was time and place specific. If you're going to address congestion, you should address it where and when it occurs. You shouldn't have a traffic cop on a corner that's not congested. The second thing I'll say, and final thing on this, is paid prioritization is thrown around a lot, and a lot of people phrase it exactly as Professor you did, talk about you know, pay for play. Really what the internet service providers mean when they talk about paid prioritization is not you paying more for faster speed, because people do that today. You can pay for a higher service tier. What they mean is having the edge provider, the content provider, the person on the other end of the line also paying them to get their content to you faster. So sometimes this gets very uh, couched in economics debates terms, and people talk about two-sided markets. You know, we could or one could debate the benefits of those, but it's different than just simply saying you can't pay more for more speed because you and I can. The question is, does AT&T or Comcast get to charge Netflix extra as well? Thank you very much. Mr. Wood, this is a pointed question to you. You are part of a lawsuit of 22 state attorneys general to block the FCC's order this past year. Can you explain your theory of the case and why you think you're likely to win? Uh, sure, in two minutes. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I am, I am proud to have been appointed an attorney general, but that's not actually the case. Uh, it is a lawsuit that uh, 22 states have joined in, but they would be a separate 
party, you know, Free Press, Public Knowledge, Open Technology Institute, a few of us groups that are based in DC and other places are also challengers or petitioners on the FCC rule just adopted last December. Uh, also in that suit right now are Mozilla and uh, Santa Clara County, uh, which has taken an interest because obviously Silicon Valley is uh, very near and dear to their hearts. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with procedure for a second, and then we'll talk more about the case and the merits, I'm sure, as we go. Those lawsuits were probably filed early. I mean, if the uh, substantive intricacies here weren't enough for you, uh, there also are a lot of different triggers for filing deadlines, and people taking Fed courts might be interested in this, and nobody else, everyone else can take a nap. But you know, the FCC's finality of their rules is actually based on when they're published in the Federal Register. That has not even happened yet here some five weeks after the FCC voted on December 14th to repeal these rules and to change the legal framework once again. So the reason I dwell on that is, yes, we went to court, but those suits were filed early. We explained that to the FCC. They probably agree. They wouldn't tell us they did for sure, and that's the reason we did it, is that back in 2015, when, as there always is, there was litigation, uh, a few folks filed early, and they actually had the lottery run at that point, and the appellate court that heard the case was picked in what you might say was a jurisdictionally premature time period for that to happen. So when we do go back, we'll argue about all these things I've been talking about. Legal classification, the need for and the structure of the content rules, uh, the transparency rules, and whether those are effective, and whether all of this was properly noticed. You know, Speaking of the attorneys general, it's really been the New York attorney general who's led on this, but talking about the unprecedented nature of this docket at the FCC. I'm sure there were tens of millions of legitimate comments in the docket, and that blows away every previous record. But there also, I think, are undeniably lots of fake and fraudulent comments in that record where you know, senators' names have been used and people who passed away, their names are in the docket. And so it's kind of a mess, and that's why there are procedural aspects to our challenge as well as substantive ones on the legal definitions and on the uh, conduct rules and the content of those rules. So I, I agree that it's an interesting phenomenon. It will take a while for it to be published in the Federal Register. Actually, the 2015 order issued under the Obama administration, I think, took six months, eight months? No, no, that was 2010. That was 20, 2010. Was 2015 was relatively tidy. The rules were voted at the end of February, and they were in the Federal Register by April 12th. So they, it takes, but even that's a couple, it's not unusual for it to take time. It was released on January 4th. And there's a certain amount of this that has to happen. I give a lot of credit to the current chairman. He's adopted a number of transparency policies, which we've never had before. Orders that they get voted on get released to the public three weeks in advance. So, and, bef and, and that had never happened before. I think those are all really positive. There's an aspect of this challenge which I think is unlikely to succeed. The Supreme Court in 2005 in Bandex held that, uh, they, that this is governed by, that the agencies have discretion. It's ambiguous. For those you, they get every, FCC gets Chevron deference, for those of you who are lawyers. But the agencies have a fair amount of discretion to do things as long as it's reasonable. And the reclassification that they just did again in January was basically that reclassification. And the question then will be, as Matt says, is did they turn nice corners in doing that? Did they explain the record and all that? And um, I, agencies generally get deference on this stuff. They win these more than they ought. They don't. I think that they're likely to win. Uh, but we shall see. I mean, that's uh, predicting litigation is always risky. What Matt didn't talk about that's really invoked by the state issues, which is something that's coming up in the news in the cycle right now, is among other things, the FCC preempted additional state action. Not only did they withdraw the rules, but they preempted the ability for states to act in the void. And that is a step that has really never been in play before, and it's very different. Uh, there's a lot of interesting law. We've, the courts of uh, DC circuits, I mean, I'm sorry, the FCC has done this before with something called the computer inquiries, which was the, before the big, was the big regulatory regime goes back and forth in this, and we'll have some interesting discussions about that. And some states are looking for interesting ways and creative ways to try to take action in the space. And the most interesting part of this suit will be that, because that's something we've never really seen before. Let's do two more, or one more round on this, because I think we're starting to get into a, a flash point here. So we'll give you, uh, Mr. Wood, two minutes to respond, and then you again, Professor Yu. Yeah, I mean, those are, those are two interesting aspects where, where you finished, and I'll, I'll pick up there. Uh, the preemption question is very interesting. I can't claim to have exhaustively researched this, but pretty exhaustively. And I think the FCC has only won on this theory once in recent times, and that is citing no express statutory preemption authority. They have said basically, we are going to occupy the field. Broadband is an interstate service, and so the states can't act there, even though we, the FCC, have decided the federal government has no jurisdiction either. Uh, so that's interesting. I mean, 
the current chairman has done a lot of things differently than his predecessors. One of the things he did when he was in the minority and uh, in dissenting quite often in the Obama administration was he said, you can't preempt a, a state laws that prohibit local broadband systems by municipalities unless you cite specific statutory authority for that. And he also said the specific statute cited by that FCC was not enough. So now we have this much broader field preemption claim coming out from this FCC saying, we don't need to cite a specific statute. We preempt because the service is interstate, and we think that's a better regulatory policy. Now, I think it's an interstate service, too. Don't get me wrong. I just think everything else the FCC has done is problematic. And that's why the states can step in. And as they've always done, there are some local aspects to interstate services. And we've always had in the phone system that kind of interstate versus intrastate issue uh, that goes all the way back to Commerce Clause decisions. So that's interesting, and we can talk more about that. On the, on the Chevron deference point, I, I agree. Uh, th this has been a Chevron line of cases up till now. Chevron deference is not infinite. And it's funny because in 2005, when the FCC went the wrong way, in my view, they were upheld by the Supreme Court in Brand X on Chevron deference. In dissent was noted liberal firebrand Justice Scalia saying, no, that's wrong. This is clearly, based on the statute, a telecommunication service, meaning something that transmits information for us and is not itself some kind of information service. So that line between transmission and content, which is complicated, but we think uh, clear and it has to be maintained. So in the era of Justice Gorsuch now and people saying maybe we shouldn't have Chevron deference for major questions, I think coming at this as an academic and an advocate is interesting because, as you said so well, uh, trying to predict what they'll do this time around just based on the last few rounds is pretty hard. The specific preemption case he's talking about, uh, which went the other way, involves a slightly different issue. For those of you who don't follow this that closely, many states have prohibited cities within the same state from building their own municipal broadband networks. And the FCC in the last administration put an order saying we preempt that rule. And there is a line of Supreme Court authority tracing back to Gregory versus Ashcroft that limits the federal government's ability to interfere with the state's relationship with its own cities. Uh, that aspect really isn't here. That federalism overlay doesn't apply here in the sense that we're, there's not overturning a state law that has a statewide law that affects the relationship with the cities. Here you get to an interesting set of cases from the computer inquiries, interesting to lawyers and geeks like me. It's preemption, so you, for anyone who's a lawyer knows this, this is god-awful law. I mean, this is not going to be neat, tidy law, but there's something called North Carolina Utilities Commission out of the Fourth Circuit, California Three out of the Ninth Circuit. There's a whole line of cases, and I will say that they are complicated. I mean, it's not like you'll see uniform wins or losses, but the FCC won in the Fourth on Computer Two. They lost in the Ninth on Computer Three. And we're going to have to have a very interesting fight about that particular preemption aspect of it. But what's interesting is I agree with it's actually I, we're surprisingly agreeing on a lot of stuff. I think this is, should be interstate. The, um, the, the, the difference, you know, if you want to sharpen the dispute a little bit, um, I don't think non-discrimination is always the right, at, the right attitude. So um, to use a student audience, uh, to give one example, one beneficiary that you almost all benefit from of classic discrimination is the classic student discount which is um, you see you're getting charged less for the same meal that I get charged. And the answer is there are times that you want to do that, particularly because if you charge one uniform price, uh, the students who are, have no money can't go. And so what you can do is actually get, create a discounted price for people that's still above cost and still good for everybody so they can go and shop and do well. And at that point, you're actually, uh, if you had to do a uniform price, you wouldn't be able to do it, but the ability to differentiate does, makes that possible. And I will say from a service standpoint, I would pay for a better connection from my home to my office and my email server and the handful of locations I do well because I use them so intensively and they're just much more important to me. Those sorts of interesting services and some other that I'm happy to talk about will start to show some of the, so we're not in complete agreement here, this is supposed to be a debate, some of the differences between me and Matt. Thank you. Mr. Wood, a question for you. If our, if our concern here is unfairness and, and censorship, the blocking and the, and the discrimination uh, principles we raised earlier, what stops the Federal Trade Commission from simply coming in, being our main regulator when there's cases of, of unfairness and uh, anti-competitive discriminatory acts, and bringing enforcement actions? What, what prevents us, or why should we not just go that route? Yeah, I, there are several things that we think of as problematic with the FTC to, to squeeze a whole other huge category of law into two minutes. I think I would try to narrow it down here and say the Federal Trade Commission does have a similar statute to the Federal Communications Commission in some respects. Now, the FTC doesn't have rulemaking authority as a general rule, 
So they couldn't have the kinds of rules against blocking and throttling in advance, and it would be all after the fact enforcement. And I can't help but pause on that point and note that the, our friends at the Internet Service Provider uh, community changed their tune on that quite a bit. They'll say, Federal Communications Commission, we need bright line rules. We need to have clarity in advance. And you'll say, what about the FTC? And they'll say, yes, yes, we love the FTC because we do after the fact adjudication and everything's post hoc. So I've learned this trick in DC. If you don't like a standard, you call it vague. And if you like it, you call it flexible. And really, the only difference is the adjective. Um, but the reason the FTC probably can't even do anything about blocking, if they do have any power, if the standard is a good way to come at it, is that here we get to squeezing a whole area of law into two minutes. Uh, the FCC statute says unfair and deceptive practices are prohibited. Now, the Federal Communications Commission that draws the ire of the cable and phone company says unjust and unreasonable. So you want to talk about a great fight for lawyers. Like, unjust and unreasonable is too hard on us, but unfair and deceptive we understand perfectly. Mm -hmm. eh, I don't believe it. But I also don't think the FTC can stop blocking because they have essentially mothballed the unfair part of their statute. They do a lot of uh, antitrust enforcement at the FTC, and they also do uh, a fair amount of privacy policy work. And again, that goes back to basically if the company tells you what they're going to do and then keeps that promise, they're OK. So if a company says, you know what, we are going to block some websites, I don't see how the FTC could go back at them unless they were to unearth and revive this unfairness doctrine um, that they have been, you know, lost themselves in court on, but more, we're talking about the 70s now rather than the 90s and the, the aughts and more recent cases when the FTC really withdrew from that part of its statu statutory mandate. So um, it's a bit of a nit, but lawyers do this. Um, actually, the FTC does have rulemaking authority, uh, and if you go to their web page, I was surprised you see off actually, used. I think no, you should say off They have used. about 20 or 30 rules there. Now, the interesting thing, they have a higher level of procedural requirements and hoops they have to jump through. I, don't, I think that the point is well taken is that it's harder for them to make rules. I think that's true, but it's often stated category they lack real, that's just not true. It is, they're held to a higher procedural level. I don't think we'd really disagree on that, but it's just, whether that's good or bad is a different question. What's interesting to me is um, <laughs> the question about rules in advance versus ex post adjudication is a really interesting one. And, and from a lawyer's standpoint, um, what always struck me was, I always think about three different forms of literature. One is the rules versus standards literature, which we're taught in law school. I'm also thinking about um, the, uh, the difference between what we call per se illegality, that you can't do it absolutely rules in advance, versus rule of reason and antitrust law. And the last thing was the codification movement that happened in the late 1900s, where people said, we need rules in advance. And what, what, what's interesting to me is uh, the rules in advance are as, never as clear as the people who want them think they are. And the ex post adjudication probably are never as vague because contracts, torts, property, almost everything we teach you in the first year was all done in common law. And basically, we understand how to do most of those things. What's striking to me is the internals of the rules versus standards or the uh, per se legality rule reason framework says, when do we do rules? It's when we have a lot of experience with something we can say with great confidence when there's no baby in the bathwater, we don't need to do these costs. But there's a reason why we still do tort liability through re re reasonableness under the totality of the circumstances. And when we could have clearly bright line rules in conduct that's very common. And it's the reason the codification movement ultimately failed, which is when you have a dynamic, multivaried phenomenon, and I would say internet access right now is one, um, it actually, there's a real danger that by creating a rule, you may lose something. The best example is what we call zero rating. For those of you who have T-Mobile, they will allow you to write, T-Mobile will allow you to use a product called Binge On, which will let you do unlimited video without accounting against your data cap. The last administration did an order that was very, report was very skeptical of it. The current administration withdrew that report and ended that investigation. That's the kind of emerging practice that sort of hangs in the balance between these two interpretations. Thank you, Professor. An economic question for you. We know that half-second delays, even as small as that, can cause significant drop-offs in subscribers and users of any app or service. With that in mind, how are, are we not concerned that uh, paying for extra speed by big players like Pokemon Go, like Netflix, is going to cause competitive problems for small startup companies that want to get into data-heavy services that won't be able to front the same amount of cash as them? It actually is not quite true that half-second delays are bad for all apps. Actually, the, the key idea is that apps vary in their tolerance for delay. So if it's a file transfer program, if an email shows up half a second later, most of us won't notice. If you're doing a phone call and there's a half a second lag on it, you'll be talking over your other person constantly. We've all had that experience. 
And if you look back in the original design of the internet, they had it optimized essentially for email and file transfers. And they started to change the architecture from the very beginning because voice needs a different set of services. In other words, if it drops a packet, we need to get something that's fast, even if it's not as reliable, is basically the trade-off they made. And we're starting to see this with more and more applications, and particularly video. Real-time interactive applications that are particularly image heavy are very sensitive to delay. Um, Pre-recorded video, if you don't mind it buffering for a second, it'll, once it starts, it'll actually work flawlessly. And so one of the interesting things about prioritization is if you are on your phone call and you're in a dead spot, uh, most of these, uh, most networks are engineered that if you're on your phone and you're uh, having trouble getting in low bandwidth, they will hold your data and give you your voice. They will discriminate between two applications, generally for your benefit, because you care about the lag, and if you're on your phone, um, it's more important that it comes through and you're probably not checking your email anyway. And so this is an interesting way that taking advantage of the growing heterogeneity of the way people are using the internet to actually vary the way the internet provides you services. And in some ways, I think of what we're seeing in terms of the development of the different services is a response to uh, the natural response of a provider trying to satisfy customers. I'll give me another example. Financial services have exited the internet completely. Why? They need millisecond latencies. Markets move prices, and in fact, one of the hottest retail market, real estate markets in Manhattan is the real estate around the network interconnection point, because they need to get closer and closer to them. And it's gotten to the point where they've actually introduced lag, uniform lag, so people don't do this race to the bottom trying to buy real estate. That's another example of an app that needs something very different that the current best efforts the internet can't support. And so we start to see, what, are they pay and because they can't get it from the network, they're paying for a private line connection, which is their alternative. They're still paying just not in a shared infrastructure that would support the way we've gotten to the internet. Yeah. OK, so there's a lot there. Um, as what Professor Yu has just said shows us is that we do have private lines still possible, even with the net neutrality rules when they were in place. And we've always had that in the telecom networks. So that is not really something new. Yes, it, you know, remote, remote surgery and medical applications often comes up. Don't you want? people to have good access to medical care on the internet, well, I probably don't want surgery done on the best efforts internet. You know, that probably would be something where you'd want to buy a dedicated line. So that has happened in the past. That still happened under the rules that have just been struck down. It's probably something that will be allowed in the future as well, no matter what regime we come to, even if the current, we would say, radically deregulatory uh, attempt by this administration doesn't win out. So there are ways to solve for this. I think it, we're, we're doing a lot of legal noodling. I don't want to get into engineering and pretend I know enough about that stuff. But for a lot of the kinds of delays and latency issues that Professor Yu is talking about, capacity solves them or does a lot to solve them, I guess I would say, just to be somewhat more careful and qualified. So yes, as I, what I said earlier, some networks get congested and some get congested a lot. Most of the current landline broadband networks we have coming into your home are not getting congested, at least not in most parts of the day. And so there are questions about economic incentives that we want to talk economics. Should we be incentivizing building out more capacity, as we see with things like Verizon Fios and Google Fiber when that was a thing? Or should we be allowing providers to use that common infrastructure and to limit capacity, or at least to respond to limited capacity by charging more for a bigger portion of that pipe? So I'll go back again to this fact that we actually can and do buy more speed today as internet users. You said you would pay more for a better connection to certain servers you use. The question is, should you be allowed to do that? I would say yes. Should then the internet service provider say, you've bought more capacity, here's what you're allowed to use it on. Only on certain servers, only on certain websites, only on certain applications. Frankly, I don't need Comcast or Verizon telling me which services I can use with the capacity I've purchased. I would rather have that capacity and make that decision for myself. And that's why we think the non-discrimination rights that we had in place under the law and under the rules are so important. It leaves the user in control of that rather than the edge provider and the ISP negotiating between themselves for who gets there first. This is our last question before we'll go to uh, live audience questions. And this can be for either of you to lead off with and have the other respond. We, had, we saw recently, in the past couple of years, Brazil implementing their civil rights framework for, uh, for the internet, a bit of a departure from what we're doing here in the United States. To what extent do the broadband policies of other countries affect how we approach net neutrality? Obviously, internet services are cross-country, servers are in one place, clients can be in another. Are we expecting other people to follow in the footsteps of the recent order, or do we think that that's going to be a problem compatibility-wise going forward? 
I, I don't know what to say exactly. I mean, yes, it matters, and especially because people do talk to each other in, in other countries, and the, the internet is a network of networks, as we all know or should know. So it definitely matters. I, I think that this tends to get perhaps spun a little bit too much in debates. Like, if we do this, then they'll do that over there, and that'll be the end of the world. I, I don't know that that's really the case. Um, and, you know, again, I think I see advocates doing this all the time. They'll, they'll point to Europe and say, see, it's terrible because the speeds are too slow. But then some people used to say, oh, it's too fast. There was an advocate in D.C. who used to talk about, you know, we don't need, uh, what did he say, Maserati speeds. You know, Toyotas are fine for most people. So uh, you, you just get this kind of understandable but sometimes silly attempt to claim either that the laws in other countries have an extra territorial effect on us here, quite literally, or that the precedent set will be bad. And I wouldn't deny that the precedents are bad. I mean, I'll, I'll point at an Obama administration official for once and not the current administration. You know, one of them got in trouble for saying, we don't want China blocking, why would we want AT&T blocking? I think that's an interesting question. I wouldn't say that those two are exactly the same thing. Or despite what, there's another former Republican commissioner, McDowell, who used to say, or another one too, Harold Furch got Roth. You know, if, when they see us regulating the internet here, which is debatable, and I think they're framing it wrong, that will embolden China and Russia to block. And I, I, just, I think people do these things for their own reasons. You know, global politics around communications rights are not dictated or swung strictly by the FCC, even though, of course, it matters how the network operates across international borders. So if you're asking about how international developments will affect U.S. law, uh, whether you believe that, I believe that's always been somewhat limited, frankly, but uh, current, this, in this current administration, probably even more so. I mean, it's just the reality we're in, it might, I don't think it matters. Build a wall. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, I do think U.S. policy has tremendous influence internationally. Um, most regulators don't have the capacity to do studies, and so what they generally do, and I went to, I was at Mobile World Congress, which is the biggest gathering, they have a ministerial there, when the 2015 order dropped. And the basic thing they say is, if the EU and the U.S. are on the same page, and at that point the EU basically was, the presumption in most regulators is that's what they're going to do. Or the burden of proof is clearly on someone else to pull together an argument to go the other way. And what you've probably seen is the EU had a very strong proposal out of the parliament. They've retrenched some. We retrenched some. And I'm sure, I'll be inter I'm actually going in the end of next month, and it will be interesting to see how they react. My guess is they'll be a bit puzzled. Um, by trying to make the sense of it because it's easier for them when there's a clear consensus between the U.S. and the EU and they sort of follow that lead uh, as we go. Um, but it's, um, I would say, probably less that the world will follow the U.S. lead under the current administration than has been true in the past. I want to, I realize I didn't fully answer one question because you asked it in terms of innovation, your last one to me. I want to boil it down because I got into the examples. The, what I would take away, there are innovation interests on both sides of this issue to me. There are innovators like financial services and other things who want something different from the network. They can't get it from the current architecture. And even among people who are current, using the current architecture, um, bloggers who are sent text stuff does not need big fancy speeds. Video needs big fancy speeds. And so what we're seeing is if we have a single uniform internet with one class of service and everyone has to pay for it, what you're going to end up having is people paying for stuff that they don't necessarily need. A blog actually is not, this doesn't need to speed. Latency, it doesn't really matter that much. A half second delay on, on text is going across. And what we're starting to see is differences come out that way as well. So to me, there's innovation on both sides. And it, getting more complex into it is much more interesting to me. Can I, can I just answer on that one briefly? I, want to get to the, I think the blogger who doesn't need video speeds is paying for their own upstream capacity and doesn't need to overpay. Most users are not going to say, I only want text. You know, the user might pay more to have a more robust line that can handle video. But I just, I don't think, this is a much longer question we get into now, but I don't think it's fair to say the blogger is paying for my videos. You know, it's just not really the way network economics work, if you ask me, but that's obviously a, not just a debate, but a symposium maybe we could have someday. All right, we've got about 15 minutes left. We're going to turn to live audience questions. Um, here, you can take this one. We're going to, uh, so we'll take off the time limit for this one. If there's any questions that you submitted that you didn't hear, uh, this is the time to ask them, and then we'll let you all... We'll let you all head out at about 12.50 because we know a lot of you have one o'clock classes. I guess one question I have is what would you say to the consumer who pays for 10 megabytes per second who actually prefers the new rules because Comcast allows them to get 100 megabytes per second if they're accessing some approved video service like Google or Amazon. To that consumer, is that actually a benefit? 
I don't think that's happening. I mean, I, if well, I, I, I guess it's I mean, in my mind it's similar to zero rating. Is that well, no? But see, right? under under the old rules too, this you're really talking about capacity. And so, if Comcast charges me for up to 10 megabits per second, sometimes it's going to be less than that if the network's congested. If instead they're providing faster speeds to me, that's good for me. It might be bad business for them. Although I would say it isn't even that because it doesn't actually charge that. It doesn't. They don't have a big marginal cost for doing that. Nothing about the old rules prohibited them providing more raw capacity to you. You know, it, it, it was done neutrally. So I have 100 megabits per second now, accidentally, even though I'm paying for 10. I can use it for anything, video, anything else. Like they, it's, it, I just don't. I, I kind of reject the premise of the question, I guess, without being too argumentative, because I don't know if I'm missing something. Right. Maybe I'm missing. So uh, under zero rating, it wouldn't. It would be limited to that specific service. Right? Yeah, but so. we didn't see zero rating. Uh, you know, you're talking about speed rather than the amount, I guess. That's what that's what I'm missing. So you're saying, you know, you're allowed to go over your cap. So yes. you know, the speed is how much I'm getting at a certain time. The cap is how much I'm allowed to use per month. And while Professor Yu is right, there was this debate about zero rating. Uh, funnily enough, because they see it as better business, most of the mobile carriers have now gone back to an unlimited approach as well. So that's another fascinating area of, of debate. You know, are we better off if, if bandwidth is metered out and I'm only allowed to use up to a certain cap per month and then I pay for over that? Some people would say that's better for consumers and others would say it's worse. Um, but the new rules you know, do allow for that, for that kind of zero rating, because there are no rules preventing it. They've taken away all the rules. I would say under the old rules, that were just struck down, that behavior might have been allowable too. It's just that the FCC was able to and was, in fact, looking into whether it was actually pro-user and pro-edge provider rather than being something that was strictly pro-cable company. I think you've hit the nail right on the head. So if you took binge on away from my kids, they would be pissed. You know, they're getting a real benefit from doing this. Now, there's a couple yeah. really interesting things about this. First, T-Mobile is the number four player. And if they try to compete based on network quality and bandwidth, at and and Verizon have them right now. Now, they're trying to make it better. It opens up the number of dimensions they can compete because they're appealing to a small group of, of subscribers. And they're doing a niche play, basically. And they're finding people who are probably more tolerant of packet loss and all these other things. And I actually think it's a really good competitive move that allows diversification to make those things happen. Interestingly, uh, AT&T, with the direct TV acquisition, is, is experimenting with different form, new business models of video distribution. Uh, Comcast is making an on a video product available to its subscribers. It's complicated because it's part of their cable service. I mean, we get into these interesting definitional problems. But what we're seeing is these new business models really emerge that I think are quite exciting. And if you have to bear in mind, Binge On was pioneered by Metro PCS when it was the number eight provider in a 3% market share. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm often providing LTE on, on 1G spectrum, these tiny slivers. I'm sorry, what they do should be per se legal. And uh, they had, were subject to the first network neutrality complaint under the 2010 order. Uh, there's no complaint. Much, much, mean... much broader. Um, we do, as Matt points out, we do have private line service, but there's a new thing going on that's sometimes called network virtualization or network slicing, which is part of the key 5G business model, which is uh, the problem with the, the, the private line solution that Nat mentions is you have to buy it 24-7, 365. You buy a line and it's yours. What they're experimenting now is basically pr temporary private line service on a stand-up and take-down basis, which is I need this connection not all the time, but I need it between this hour and this hour because I'm doing something. And they're going to allow you to reserve resources in a sort of a, a short-term private line service. And it's going to give you a better, faster connection, and you're going to have to pay for it. And many people see that as the version of 5G. And many people believe, and there's a whole bunch of writing coming out of Europe and other places that think that certain implementations of network neutrality, because this is pay for play. You're paying for better service on a temporary basis. Um, they think that uh, strong form implementations of non-discrimination potentially stand in the way. Now, maybe we don't, and we'll get into arguments. We never really got to that part of the implementation of the order. But the question is, will the ambiguity around this harm people from experimenting with different business models, my position would be is um, ex post case by case, I've been called in successive speakers in a panel a, a network neutrality re regulationist and deregulationist because I believe in ex post case by case enforcement, which means I do believe in some enforcement, but I think you wait, let someone try the practice, and if the consumer harm is shown, stop them. 
But the problem is by reversing it the other way, you never find out. You put the burden of proof on innovation, and, and you lose the breathing room that innovation needs to experiment with different solutions. I do think we need some form of backstop here to make sure that it's fair, but absolutely to prevent people who haven't tried something from trying it in the first instance so we can find out what the impact is, I think is bad for innovation. I will briefly fill time as you go to the next question. I, Finjon has gone away in, its, in that form because they've gone to unlimited. So I think I just have to say, if you say to people, you can have free video over your limit, they'll say yay. But if you say instead, actually, there is no limit, people will prefer that over having something parceled out to them on a non-neutral basis, even though they're not sitting there thinking about it in net neutrality terms. And we can argue with the carriers about whether it's a better business model for them or for the entire internet if we have metered plans instead. But you know, it is not just the, it's not a fact of life. There has to be a limit. And only by allowing this kind of innovation can we get past those limits. We've actually gotten past them today with most carriers. Well, but the, the, the other thing that's interesting to me about Binge on, I do think, well, we have a factual question. I think it still exists because unlimited plans get it. I do think that if you have to buy above a certain plan, you can get it even if you have a cap. The most fascinating thing to me about it is it's a video specific solution. Mm -hmm. which is it takes the resol it mostly succeeds by taking the resolution from high definition down to standard definition to reduce the bandwidth it's requiring. Now, this is a very creative solution that actually is targeted at the problem, which is video. It cannot be done in an application neutral way. You cannot reduce the resolution of other things because video is a unique product in this way. And it addresses the problem that is causing congestion on the network today. And so what's interesting to me is on a technical side, if we say everything has to be done in a pure application neutral way, you will lose some efficient technical solutions which we wouldn't otherwise have. Um, so my question is, in the 2015 rulemaking order, the FCC only cited one violation of what would become the net neutrality rules. And that violation they were able to correct without the expanded powers of the 2015 um, rulemaking. So I guess my question is, uh, what's to say that this becomes a bigger problem in 2017 than it was pre-2015? And what really is the necessity of keeping expanded rules that weren't necessary in the first place? Which one are you thinking of? Because I think they cited more than just one. I, I thought they only cited one, maybe two. And in both cases, I, I don't remember the exact, mm -hmm. um, which exactly the case was. But in both cases, I know that they were able to solve the well, right. So the legal framework has shifted over time, but we have had some kind of rules or principles in place basically continuously. So I mentioned earlier the Comcast throttling BitTorrent. And what happened there was that Kevin Martin, the Republican FCC chairman, said that's not a thing we want. We don't want Comcast blocking BitTorrent. So he actually took an enforcement action against Comcast. Comcast sued. Now they changed their behavior after the enforcement action. So that's a good thing. But they sued and they struck down the legal framework on which that enforcement action was based. So again, I think I would not entirely agree with the notion that it was solved without these rules. It was solved with a version of these principles later found to be legally unsound by an appellate court. There are others. And the reason I say there's more than one is you had telephone companies blocking VoIP. You had providers blocking access to things like FaceTime and Skype on the mobile network. You've had providers blocking payment applications that Google owned in favor of their own payment applications. And this is funny. The ISP's payment application was called ISIS. Uh, so bad branding, but they, how could they have known in advance? So there have been actually several circumstances. There are some a little bit outside of the ISP realm, where Verizon was blocking text messages sent by NARAL and saying, we have the ability and authority to block unsavory content. So I think all of those problems were addressed with versions of these rules and principles that were later found to be unsound by an appellate court based on the legal foundation. And the 2015 rules are largely the same. They've evolved over time, as Professor Yu notes. Largely the same as those principles that were struck down, but now once again based on solid legal authority to address these and future problems that we just might not be able to contemplate right now. I, I guess I agree with the question. Basically, you don't see a lot of these examples. In fact, the last time I had one of these debates was last week, and the person I was debating says, we don't actually see a lot of these. I, think, I can think of two examples. Uh, but one of the, and I guess I should be saying this as a professor, I actually wrote a paper looking at all the examples cited. Some of the ones that um, actually Matt mentions are often cited, in my opinion, miscited. Uh, in the debate. So the NARAL was about text messaging. Actually, that's outside of network neutrality. Have the order, don't have the order, won't affect it. And prohibited by Title II. And to, but my point is that's which is it's the not, solution in but, search of a problem that we found. But it's not, this wasn't really about the network, in the network neutrality order. Um, 
Google Wallet and the payment system uses near field communications, which also isn't really touched by this. Now, some people would say, we don't really care. <laughs> it's all about communications. And to some extent, the problem we have is an old statute that's really built around technology, so we have to care. I mean, this we're fighting over dis definitions written decades ago, which were not, didn't have the internet in mind. But there's an, and there's an interesting question hanging in the balance here about how many examples you need before you act. The flip side is, remember, the other side is how many examples on the other side of innovations we're going to lose, and we have to take this all into account to, to really make them go. And so what I, I think that was interesting is I, I do find that there is a dearth of, of concrete you know, examples, as you mentioned. Uh, but I do think that what Matt says is the alternative is to build more capacity instead of managing the network. Um, the problem with that is it's expensive. And the, we're not going to, and what we see is a lot of people um, in rural communities and minority communities actually filed in opposition because if you can only build more, build more bigger pipes, that your break-even number goes up. And so there's actually a concern that there's a deep interaction between this and some of the digital divide stuff, not just an innovation standpoint, but in terms of the service we provide people. And so why, the question is, if we can do an OPEX solution and operational expenses instead of capital expenses, why will we tie one hand behind our back? Because there's different things that are appropriate at different times. We have time for one last question. I'm going to keep talking, annoyingly. <laughs> the, the rural and uh, communities of color solution is a little more complicated than was just said. And there actually were a lot of people who were on our side in that. Mm -hmm. And I do want to go back to this notion that we can discriminate our way to innovation. I mean, I think that's the genius of the internet, is that the innovation can happen in a lot of places. So I would just ask people to question whether or not we need to discriminate in the network in order to innovate, or if, in fact, the absence of discrimination is what allows for innovation to flourish. So I guess uh, my question is, you previously made the distinction between uh, discriminating pr uh, speed for price against consumers, which we both recognize has already kind of gone on with mm -hmm. these ISPs discriminating against content providers in terms of um, speed for the price they charge them. But doesn't that already happen in some ways with larger companies having either duplicate servers in various areas or CDNs? Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, really what changes under the new system? So CDNs and other methods to increase, so, I mean, a lot of this debate stems from 2005. Ed Whitaker, who was then CEO of SBC, which is now AT&T, said Google shouldn't be allowed to use my pipes for free. And so what he was claiming was, for the first time, I think, the phone company's right to charge not just their customer, but the person making the call as well. You know, there's a whole history here of telecom services being regulated as to price. And so they could exchange money with each other, and they could make that connection work, or they could each just charge their own customers, and each phone company making itself whole based on resort only to its own customers. But I think what you're pointing to is the notion that, yes, I can improve my speeds if I take technological steps to get my content closer to the user. That's just a fact of physics and of networks. Uh, the question is, should the ISP be charging for that privilege or be monetizing it in some way? Or should others be allowed to take those steps to improve their speeds and not have that kind of gatekeeper in the middle in terms of what the cable or phone company does to their traffic? So to step back about what this issue is about, if you want to, if you want to get better service, you can build your own data center closer to your customer. You'll get lower latency, you'll get better responses, and it belongs to you. And other companies called content dis distribution networks, the biggest of which is Akamai based here in Cambridge, uh, do this on a third party basis. You don't have to build your own data center. We'll build a data center and we'll sell it out to third parties as a service. And we'll give you better service, but you're going to have to pay for it. This is a great example of substituting storage for networking. In other words, we don't really need to rely on the network. We'll just build more storage facilities and reduce that. That's a great move. When you can't get prioritized service from the network, it's your only move. You can only do it in the technically build more facilities solution. The interesting question is, can we open up the space where you don't have to pay that person? Instead, we'll find a network-based solution that actually may allow different kinds of sharing and different kinds of aspects. Because what really makes this all go, the reason the internet works so well is we're all sharing capacity that used to be dedicated to one person. We can make people buy their own CDNs and do this, but this actually unlocks the potential. And that's the whole idea behind network slicing. And we've seen it in cloud. Instead of having your own computer, you share it with other people so you don't need to pay for it when you're not using it. This is all the notion of virtualization. In many ways, there are business models that would take this to the next step in the network that are actually in extreme tension with traditional network neutrality. And the worry is that those business models will be stifled unless uh, with too restrictive uh, limits on what the uh, providers can do. 
Yeah, I think it's just important to note that increasing speed is not the same thing as prioritizing one packet over another, though. So ISPs were not stifled from providing CDN services. They, in fact, did that under the, every version of the rules we've had. And uh, yeah, that is the question. Should, should we be allowing for new business models that prioritize certain packets and essentially slow down others? Or is it better to have a neutral framework where you can pay for more speed, you just can't pay for your speed to be faster than the other guys? Thank you very much. It is 12.51, so we're going to wrap up there. But thank you both for a phenomenal discussion on behalf of Berkman, Klein, and Jolt. And we'll see you hopefully in the future. Yeah. For the same topic.